but um, we all worry about the distress of mice. So um, it gives me great pleasure now to welcome back Dr. Vanessa Shamey. And uh, Dr. Shamey will give us the state of the art talk on something very important that we all have to deal with, which is a diagnosis and management of pancreatic cysts. Welcome, Dr. Shamey. Thank you, Eric, and uh, thanks again to the course uh, organizers, and uh, happy Father's Day. Uh, I've never given a talk on Father's Day before, so it's kind of special. Um, so why do we care about pancreatic cysts? Well, a subset are malignant and may become a cancer. In fact, in a meta-analysis of over 6,000 patients, about 0.24% developed into malignancy. And really understanding the various cysts and the guidelines and how to manage them, really, really important. I always tell my patients, by the time you're 80, oh, I don't know, this is advancing without me uh, advancing the slides. Um, I don't know if there's anything we can do about that. But I always tell patients that by the time you're 80 years old, um, about 37% of you will actually get um, uh, assist. So just to put it in perspective. So when we talk about cirrhosis adenomas, okay, think of S, okay, S being small. It's sponge-like, um, so S, sponge, small compartments. Think of stellate scar, so it's all S's, simple way of thinking of things. And when you see these cysts, um, when you look at them by endoscopic ultrasound, they have all these tiny compartments um, and they're lined by cuboidal cells. So these small cells, again, S. Now these are common, they're seen in females, um, sixth decade of life. They rarely do occur in males as well. And they're benign, they're rare uh, reports of degeneration into malignancy. And to be honest with you, I, I'm not even sure if those were truly cirrhosis adenomas at the get-go. If you aspirate them by EUS, the CEA is low, they do not have any mucin, and they have a low amylase, and the reason being is they do not communicate with the main pancreatic duct, okay? So in order to have a high amylase, when you stick it, you need to communicate usually with the main pancreatic duct. The nice thing about these is, unless they're symptomatic, there's nothing to do for them. Sometimes over time, the bigger they are, the faster they grow, and they can cause obstruction, you know, gastric outlet obstruction, they can cause uh, obstructive jaundice, and that's the time to act. Um, but again, usually these are benign. Then you have the mucinous cisadenomas. Think of M, mucin macro, right? Large compartments. Um, you can see here uh, on this cross-sectional imaging, they have large compartments with thin septations. Um, again, an endoscopic ultrasound view, you can see the same thing, these large compartments. Um, and then they are lined by uh, these columnar cells, so larger cells, macro larger cells, um, and they have underlying ovarian stroma. So these occur in females. Um, and there are many studies out there trying to target these overlying uh, ovarian um, cells that have estrogen and progesterone receptors. So very interesting. These are pre-malignant. They occur in females in the fifth decade of life, which is very young. Let me tell you now that I'm there. Um, they occur in the body and tail of the pancreas, um, and they can range. I think of them as polyps are to the colon. They can be uh, like adenomatous, they can be premalignant, they can be dysplastic, and then they can be cancer. Um, when you aspirate them, again, they do not communicate with the main pancreatic duct, so they have a low amylase. They are very thick though. So if you put a drop of the fluid and you put a finger on top of it or two glass slides, you'll see it's almost like a ball of snot. It kind of will follow both fingers or both slides. Uh, it's just viscosity. Um, and so remember these as pre-malignant cysts. Then you have the main duct. And here, the main duct is when you see the duct is really dilated because it's full of mucin. The actual neoplasia is in the pancreatic duct. And you can see this huge duct. Now this is kind of an extreme example, um, but a main, you know, large main pancreatic duct. And you can even see, if I can get the laser pointer, you can see these little nodules within the main pancreatic duct, and this would be classic. 
Now, these are, these are nothing to play with because these require surgical uh, evaluation. Um, these are pre-malignant and the chances of having a malignancy in them is quite high. So we usually will recommend that these patients go uh, to surgery. Next is the side branch IPMN. So those are the ones that you see. You see elderly people in clinic, they get cross-sectional imaging and incidentally are found to have cysts. Um, and many times they're side branch IPMNs. Here, this is kind of another extreme example. Uh, the difference is the main pancreatic duct is normal and then you have these kind of cysts that come off the main pancreatic duct. Now we're guessing when we say main versus side branch, right? Until you actually have the specimen in a bucket, we're guessing that the main duct is not involved. So this is the best we can do. Um, again, main duct looks normal. Um, we're gonna call this a side branch IPMN. So these occur in elderly, uh, sixth to seventh decade of life, although not, not that old. Uh, they range from benign to malignant. When you aspirate them, the CEA is high, okay? Um, they have a mucin in them because they are, communicate with the main pancreatic duct and they have a high amylase, again, because they, um, they communicate with the main pancreatic duct. When I say high CEA, think of the Bill Brugge, 192 is that number, right? I think of 200. Um, so if, if anything's above 200, we think of a mucinous cyst. If it's below 200, we think of potentially non-mucinous cysts. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about this uh, later on in the talk. So the cysts that we really are concentrating on are those pre-malignant cysts, the mucinous cysts, right? The mucinous cystic neoplasms and the IPMNs. So some cysts will become uh, pancreatic cancers. So how do we identify which ones are cancer? Um, and again, it's uh, forwarding again, my talk. I didn't know if there's a way to uh, prevent that. Um, so there's a way to identify which cysts um, truly are the ones that we need to follow. So when you look at the pancreatic cyst guidelines, this is a timeline of guidelines for management of pancreatic cysts. There are a plethora of them and they're almost overwhelming here. So what I do is we're gonna concentrate on the updated ones, right? The Sendai, Fukuoka, and international consensus guidelines are all the same, okay? They're just updated. And these were based on where the meeting took place. Then you have the European guidelines, which were updated in 2008. You have the AGA guidelines and the ACG guidelines. And we're gonna concentrate it on the, on the updated ones just so that we're not confused. So basic rules, if you're symptomatic from a cyst, you're probably gonna recommend surgery. If you have an associated mass, you're gonna recommend surgery. You're gonna consider surveillance only if the patient is a surgical candidate and willing to undergo surgery or the patient is willing to undergo systemic therapy, right? So if you have a 95 year old with COPD on five liters of oxygen, you're really gonna say, you know, are they gonna go to surgery? And if the answer is no, then we really don't have to survey them, but it's a conversation that you really need to have with the patient and the family in clinic. Now, this is an example I just wanted to show of a nodule. Um, when we talk about nodules within a cyst, you can see these nodules, and these are actual cases that uh, we published um, uh, for review. Now, before we go into the guidelines, I do wanna say for mucinous cystic neoplasms, if you look at the guidelines, okay, so we're taking a step back. For those, the ones that with the ovarian stroma, um, if you look at those, what you can see is mucinous cystic neoplasms in three of the guidelines, are treated just like the IPMNs, okay? They're treated just like uh, the side branch IPMNs. In the consensus guidelines, however, um, they actually recommend resection for all surgically fit patients. Um, truthfully, I use the consensus guidelines, but I actually treat them like IPMNs. So just to let you know, that's the trend, is we're treating all the mucinous cysts equally. So I wanna start off with a case. This is a 65-year-old with a cystic lesion in the tail of the pancreas. It's 2.5 centimeters. And using this case, we're gonna walk through uh, some of the guidelines. 
So first we talked about the consensus or the international consensus guidelines. Um, and what you can see is they look for the following. They look for high risk stigmata, right? They look for a dilated duct. Uh, they look for enhancing mural nodule. Um, you know, if, is the patient symptomatic? And if, if they are, they're gonna go to surgery, okay? Um, if they don't, then they look for other worrisome features, such as the elevated CA199, increased rate of growth of greater than five millimeters, thickened enhanced cyst walls. These aren't things we need to remember because it's gonna be a common theme in all of the guidelines. Now, if you have any of those, then you're gonna to go to endoscopic ultrasound, but if not, which is the majority of the case, when we're doing, seeing these patients in clinic, we are judging or basing our surveillance based on its size. Um, and here in the consensus guidelines, you can see the bigger the cyst, the more carefully you're gonna watch that person, either with um, imaging or endoscopic ultrasound. And you can see here, um, the larger the cyst, EUS plays a bigger role um, in, in the surveillance. So for our patient, they have no worrisome features. The size is 2.5. So they're gonna undergo an EUS in three to six months. Now, the main criticism of this guideline is that it's fairly aggressive um, in, in, in surveillance. And there's little mention of when to stop. You know, when, when do you stop? Um, and, and when you look at the recommendations for cysts that are greater than three centimeters, MRI with EUS every three to six months, can you imagine bringing your patient back for an EUS or MRI every three months? That's, that, that's pretty excessive. Then you have the AGA guidelines and very controversial guidelines um, because the difference is they want two high risk features, not just one to go on to endoscopic ultrasound. So they want um, a dilated duct, main, so main dilated duct, a greater than three centimeter cyst or solid component. And you need to have two of these. And if you have two of these, then you go to endoscopic ultrasound. So that's the difference. Now, if you don't, uh, then you go into the surveillance program. And what you do is uh, you re-image in a year. And then if, if everything's stable at year five, you stop. So again, if they're asymptomatic and at five years they're stable, then, then you stop surveillance. So the main criticism of this is that, let's see here if I can advance, um, is that again, the two features you need and you also stop surveillance at five years. Now, if you look at our patient, they had no high risk features. And so they would go on to surveillance with the MRI in one year. So keep that in mind. And again, the controversy important to know is that Again, you can discontinue after five years, and I don't really feel comfortable discontinuing following pancreatic cysts after five years unless somebody's, um, you know, got a debilitating uh, disease elsewhere or, or, or elderly. And then um, again, uh, you want two high risk features to go on to endoscopic ultrasound. And finally, the ACG guidelines are very much like the consensus guidelines. Um, what they show is that, again, if you have high risk features, um, you you know, if you do, if you do not have any high risk features, you're going to go on to the surveillance program based on size. So again, it's very much like the consensus guidelines. Um, and in our patient who has no high risk features, they would go, go on to EUS, um, EUS FNA because it asks, is the cyst clearly an IPMN or MCN? We don't know. Um, so they would go on to EUS FNA. I do want to say, again, this is stressing that the ACG guidelines and the international guidelines are very, very similar. The only difference is the ACG is less uh, intense surveillance within the first year. Um, these are the European guidelines. I just put them up there. Um, they're very similar as well. I don't think we're going to go through them, but just for you to know that they're out there as well. The only thing is they do identify if you're not a surgical candidate. Um, you don't need any further follow-up, but I think uh, we'll skip those just for clear, uh, simplicity. You know, it's really simple. If you look at this and we publish this, indications for surgical resection, all the guidelines are very similar. We think they're different, but they're not. So if you have a positive cytology in any of the guidelines, you're gonna 
go to surgery. If you have a solid component or a mural nodule in any of the guidelines, you're gonna consider surgery or endoscopic ultrasound. Um, if you have a dilated main pancreatic duct, you're gonna go to surgery. So these are common themes. Um, it's not, they're not that diversely different. So just to keep it in perspective. And remember we talked about those guidelines, some of them are really conservative and some of them are more aggressive. Well, my partner actually at UVA, Dr. Brian Sauer, he did a modeling study where he said, okay, he took the data that 0.24% of patients uh, went on to cancer if they had side branch IPMNs in uh, over a 15 year period. And what he noted is that it cost, and he compared the consensus guidelines and the more conservative uh, AGA guidelines. And it cost $1.2 million per additional cancer identified. So it's, it, you know, to, to save one cancer, it costs $1.2 million. Now, if you look at the number of deaths, they were similar in both groups. And that's because in the AGA guidelines, people died of cancer. In the consensus guidelines, they died of morbidity and mortality of surgery. So again, to keep in mind, there's no good or bad. It's just your, it's a, it's a little bit of a trade-off. Since then, there have been a myriad of publications, and the bottom line is, if you follow the more conser uh, conservative guidelines, um, you know, you're going to get fewer unnecessary surgeries at the expense of missing malignant cysts. Now, what do none of the guidelines consider? They don't consider fluid glucose or molecular analysis, and we're going to touch upon those in a bit. So let's go back to our case. And the consensus guidelines for that 2.5 centimeter cyst, you would do an endoscopic ultrasound in three to six months for the AGA guidelines, MRI in one year, ACG guidelines, uh, EUS, European guidelines, EUS and or MRI. Now, if I could play the video. Um, well, anyway, the video didn't play, but it is, uh, I don't know if you guys can play the video. Yeah, there you go. Uh, what you can see is, uh, there's a cyst here and there's actually a mass within the cyst so it ended up being an adenocarcinoma so a little bit scary and again this is a, not to say one one guidelines bad or good but again there's a trade-off so what i always tell patients or, 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 or physicians is when you when you're following these patients if you follow a guideline document which guideline you're going to follow and i have even better news at ddw they were meeting and they're probably going to come up with a consensus one guideline for 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 everybody um, so that'll make life a lot easier. So what are updates in pancreatic cysts uh, uh, diagnostics? Well, we do have the ability to uh, go ahead and um, use a biopsy needle. So what we do is by endoscopic ultrasound, we put a 19 gauge needle in the cyst, uh, and then we can actually put these micro biopsy forceps because where is the, the tissue? The, the tissue is the epithelium. That's what tells us what kind of cyst it is. Um, and that's the problem with fluid itself. It's so acellular, it's, it's really the epithelium. So um, when you look at this, this was a systemic review and a systematic review and meta-analysis. They saw that the pool diagnostic yield of the, through the, the biopsy needle, um, using histology was much better than CEA um, of 192. Not, not surprising, right? Um, and they also saw that it was uh, superior um, to, to, de to determine what kind of cyst it is, right? Because you're getting the epithelium. Not Again, not a surprise here. The pooled adverse event rate, though, was uh, 7%. So that's higher than just for FNA of a cyst. Then there are two other uh, systematic reviews and meta-analyses, and basically the diagnostic accuracy for the type of cyst was about 80%. The pros of this is that histology is huge, right? It tells us what kind of cyst it is. The hard part is it's a stiff needle. It's hard to kind of get it in certain parts of the pancreas for those of us that do EUS. It is costly, additional cost, and you can get adverse events, mainly uh, pancreatitis. You can get some bleeding as well. 
Then we have something called needle-based confocal laser endomicroscopy, where patients are injected with fluorescein, uh, and then they put, you put this probe into a 19-gauge needle, and again, it, it's a laser that can look at the epithelium um, like a microscope. So you get microscopic analyzation of the epithelium. Um, and depending on what it looks like, and I don't do this, so this is all foreign to me, but based on what it looks like, um, you can kind of differentiate what kind of cyst you're, you're dealing with. Again, there was a systematic review and meta-analysis, and uh, most of these actually uh, papers were prospective with the, uh, um, the minus the ones that are highlighted. Um, and what they saw was the diagnostic accuracy was 83%, so not bad. The hard part about this is there's major inter, you know, uh, um, observer variation when it comes to this um, study or comes to this technique uh, or technology. The adverse event rate was 5.41% and pancreatitis was 2.28%. Again, the pros increased accuracy. Cons, again, you're using a 19 gauge needle learning curve and interpreting images um, and time, the cost and potential increase in adverse events. This is exciting. Glucose is exciting because it's easy. So the, con the concept is um, pre-cancer cysts or mucinous cysts are more metabolically active. And so the glucose is lower in these cysts. And in this meta-analysis of eight studies of over 600 patients, they saw that low glucose, and when we think of low glucose now, now that we have more and more studies, it's less than 50 uh, is kind of the cutoff. What, what, what we saw is that um, combination of CEA and glucose was no better than glucose alone, and glucose definitely was superior uh, to CEA. So um, the days of CEA may be numbered. Um, I really think glucose uh, is, is here to, to come and stay, and I, I do think it needs to be part of the new guidelines as we get more and more data. We can also get DNA uh, for these cysts, and um, what you can see here um, for identifying IPMNs, uh, getting G GNAS and uh, KRAS improves the accuracy of IPMNs as well as um, mucinous cystic neoplasms. Um, again, molecular analysis is easy to do. Uh, it's a send out for us. Um, the only thing is it disadvantages, it is costly. So when we're talking, you know, when we're talking about um, being cost conscious, um, the test costs $4,000. It is covered uh, uh, by insurance in many cases, uh, but nonetheless, um, you know, something we need to really kind of ferret out whether the benefits outweigh the risks. I can tell you one thing is I use it only when I'm really, really unsure of what type of cyst it is and I need more information. So what does the future hold? Well, uh, Matt Moyer has this CHARM study. Um, and what he did was, you know, we used to inject alcohol into these cysts uh, to try to kind of fry the epithelium. We realized that people were getting pancreatitis um, and uh, it wasn't all that effective. And it was actually Bill Brugge who did the one, the first one with uh, alcohol. And he's also the same gentleman uh, that discovered the 192 CEA uh, level. So he's done a lot in the field. And so Matt said, well, why don't we just inject gemcitabine and uh, paxitaxel uh, in there uh, and just leave it in there, let it soak in there. Um, and the cool thing is that uh, we realized that it actually does improve uh, outcomes in terms of um, complete resolution rates versus alcohol ablation. Um, so I do think hemoablation has a, will have a role, um, probably not as first line, but in patients who have large cysts that are not surgical candidates. Um, one thing to keep in mind, um, the other thing they discovered, the advantage of chemoablation over alcohol uh, ablation, alcohol ablation did cause pancreatitis, and Matt Moyer uh, discovered that if he did chemoablation with alcohol, level of pancreatitis was similar to just alcohol alone, but when he did chemoablation alone without alcohol, there was no incidence of pancreatitis. So um, I think that's really, really uh, neat and here to stay. So I just wanna conclude by saying, uh, distinguishing mucinous from non-mucinous cysts are really, really important. Um, I say, 
you know, for the management of cysts, use your brain and the guidelines. Um, don't survey if the patient's not a surgical candidate or refuses surgery and or systemic therapy. And despite differences in controversy, guidelines suggest a roughly uh, similar approach. Remember, things to, to really worry about, dilated duct, mural nodule, associated mass, possible uh, positive cytology or biopsy. Um, and those are kind of consistent with all the guidelines. Um, and the role of pancreatic uh, glucose and molecular analysis still needs to be defined, but I really think glucose, uh, we have more and more data, and there was data presented at ECG and DDW on this. Um, I really think that's going to be one of our first line tests and make it hopefully to the new uh, guideline. Um, and it would be very nice for us as gastroenterologists just to have one major guideline. So with that, I want to thank you. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Uh, we'll take a couple questions before we break. And I'll have, ask a question uh, to kick things off. So the choice of the uh, kind of chemo ablation, I mean, it seems like based on what you just showed, that goes back for, for years. Has that always been the same? And you know, with all the different um, evolution of different therapies we use for pancreatic cancer, you know, why, why not try something different? I'm a uh, good, good question. Um, you know, I, I, I think the, I think Matt, Matt's doing now a multi-center trial and we're, we're hoping to, to kind of enter it. We just are trying, it's hard to get chemo into your endoscopy suite. That's a whole bunch of, uh, logistical nightmare. Um, but uh, I, I, the data is quite good. Um, whether he, you know, he or others decide to use other things, they have. I mean, in Korea, they have. Um, but nothing has seemed to be as effective as this combination to date. Um, if anybody has any ideas, let me know. <laughs> Got it. Um, and I have another question, too. I mean, this is a little unrelated to the pancreatic cyst, but just about pancreatic cancer in general. And um, are you seeing in your practice younger patients being diagnosed with pancreatic cancer? We've been talking a lot about younger patients with colorectal cancer and other types of malignancies. Just anecdotally, in your own experience, what have you been seeing in your practice? Absolutely. We're seeing younger and younger people. Actually, the youngest one I've had was 19, but that was a one-off. Um, and it was true, pancreatic adenocarcinoma. But we are. And uh, what we're realizing is that a lot of these patients have either family histories or have, um, you know, genetic um, mutations. And so, you know, and we discovered this by, um, you know, really doing a careful history. So we're seeing them younger. We're realizing that obesity, um, smoking, I mean, I mean, obesity, since it's become a pandemic, is really, really a risk factor for a pancreatic cancer. Um, so the answer is yes, we are seeing patients younger. I don't know if you're feeling like you're seeing the same thing. I, we're seeing younger malignancies across the board, and I don't know if we, it's just our uh, diagnostic modalities are better or you know something's obviously changing in terms of uh, you know kind of the epidemiology chuck dr chami what surgical well when you're talking with your pancreatic surgeon and you have large amounts of main duct pancreatic like what level of surgery are you going to recommend or you're going to discuss with your surgeon i think that's a huge problem no, it's a huge problem. And what they do is the surgeons will do a partial pancreatectomy, like based on kind of, and then they get rapid path. Path is actually going to look at the specimen. And so if there's dysplasia or a pan in, depending on kind of the amount of dysplasia, then they'll do a total. So our, our surgeons always talk to patients about doing a total pancreatectomy up front, um, you know, potentially doing a total. And that really is determined by what's seen in the OR. Um, but you're very right. It's very hard because it's usually, you know, can involve the entire duct. Um, and so when is enough? And I've seen patients where they get a partial pancreatectomy and then they come back five years later and they're getting the rest of their pancreas removed. And uh, it's not an easy, easy to go twi undergo twice. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shami. So, uh, so what we're going to do is